Welcome to the New Grounds Podcast. Today's episode hosted by Psycho Goldfish. Hey everybody, welcome to the very special edition of the New Grounds Podcast. I'm your host, Psycho Goldfish. Uh, we got a group of Flash artists from the uh, big boom on Newgrounds days. Uh, we're going to affectionately refer to them from now on as Flash Boomers, because all of us are 30 and up. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you guys first, uh, youngest, because everybody knows the youngest people better. What can we say? <laughs> uh, we, got, <laughs> we got Matt Rosnack. Is that a, am I saying that right? Rosnack? Roshak. Roshak. Ah, one of those names. Matt Roshak. You guys might know him as <laughs> Matt Like Swords. Uh, Twitter, Koopo Games, you all know him as the creator of the Epic Battle Fantasy series. Say hi, Matt. Oh, hi, everyone. We've also got, uh, next in terms of age, similar age, really, you guys are both 30, aren't you? we got Tyler Glale. He's uh, he's known for The End is Nigh, um, freaking half of the great games on Newgrounds, Closure. And what else can you say about the guy? He's, he's, he's a pro. Tyler Glale. Hello. <laughs> Uh, one fellow that a lot of you newer users actually might not be as familiar with um, is Steve Castro. Uh, he's been on Newgrounds pretty much as long as I have. Actually, I think he signed up a little bit before me even. He's um, known on Newgrounds for doing games like Rooftop Skater, things like that. He worked with Z-Barf doing a whole bunch of games uh, like the Battle of Remus, things like that. He's also been uh, involved in the mobile gaming scene. Uh, he did uh, WWE Champions, so kind of a nice guest to have because it's Little little under the radar for a lot of people, but very cool career. So, how you doing, Steve? I'm doing great. It's good to be here. So, Flash, how about that? It's going to die this year. How do you guys feel about that? I'm still going to keep using it. <laughs> uh, I have my current like game dev tool chain that can use Flash for animation without needing to use Flash for anything else. So, I'm good there for a little bit until they delete the program itself. Right. You know, I got to say, when I first heard that Flash was dead, I remember reading that, and I was like, nah, like, there's oh. no way. Like, I'm not good at predicting what's coming down the line, you know? I, I'm pretty much, like, I just follow what other people are doing, to be honest. I love these game developers that can be like, oh, I knew it. I was, like, the first one. So, yeah, I had I had no idea Flash was Flash was actually going to die and that, and that, you know, mobile games would actually be a big thing. You know, I you look at those tablets, you know, back when they were first coming out, and I was like, come on like there's no way this is going to replace it and then you know here we are yeah it took a long time though like people were saying flash was going to die like six years ago yeah yeah and to be fair it's really only the flash browser plugin that's dying like yeah it runs fine on steam and it even works on mobile yeah i have a funny story actually um i a couple years ago i actually taught a college class as an adjunct professor teaching 2D game development to animators, but I was teaching them programming so that they had, you know, a little introduction to some programming. So it was just kind of basic games and stuff. But the tool they had me use, guess what it was? Animate. Because, nice. yeah. you know, Animate, I think people know, I actually had a hard time teaching the class because I was supposed to call it Animate, but I kept calling it Flash because, I mean, we've been using <laughs> Flash for so long. But, yeah. you know, because they were animators, it, it made sense for them to use a tool that can animate, but that can also do, you know, some programming. And we could very quickly do prototypes in class, you know, whereas like, you know, obviously like in Unity, there's a lot of like exporting and, you know, all these other steps that make it a little harder for like teaching a class, which is also yeah. what was so great about Flash. And, and part of what I miss is like, man, you could just spin up a game so fast. Like, I remember... When I had a new game idea in my head, I was so excited to be like, how fast can I get to the point where I'm playing like the the buggiest, crappiest version of, but actually playing the thing I was thinking of. And so it was really fun to yeah. be like, all right, cool. I'm going to set up the functions. I'm going to set up, you know, draw a little, little stick figure. And like within an hour, the dude was running around. <laughs> I had the initial, you know, mechanics just playing around with them already. So that was awesome. You know, and I try to do that in Unity these days and, you know, it, it takes yeah. me a couple extra hours at least, you know. Yeah, well, it takes me weeks now. <laughs> yeah. No, I would come. I would come home from school in high school with like game ideas and just make them after school <laughs> in like a couple of days. 
Yeah. Like, that's, that you, that's you're, we're missing that from, like, all the current tools, which are more more professional. Like, if you're making a game that has, you know, 50 hours of gameplay and 6 million levels and a thousand things on it, different things that you can fight, like, sure, like, Unity is probably going to be better for that than Flash ever was. But, like, you're losing out on all of the, uh, the like, you know, short, quick weekend projects that you could just bang out without putting that much, like, thought into them because flash right. just let you like open it up and make a game like you didn't have to learn fifty thousand other programs right you didn't have to like get an asset pipeline going in there you didn't <laughs> even have to like code it properly with like objects object oriented bullshit and stuff you could just like like at least in the like action script two days you could like put a ball on the screen click the ball and then type the code that makes the ball move, like, <laughs> right. right on the ball itself, all within Flash, and it would, like, move around. And you'd be like, oh, cool. AS2 would let you get with anything, get away with anything. Like, it just didn't crash, even if your code didn't make sense. Yeah. It was hard to debug, though, but uh, it was yeah. really easy to make quick prototypes. Yeah. Oh, I had to convert a AS1 project to AS2 one time, and that guy who wrote it didn't know that you should keep, like, the capitalization of your variables consistent. Details. <laughs> nice. And so there was, uh, you'd be like, all right, so this one that's in all caps is the same as this one that only has the first letter capitalized. <laughs> <laughs> and it got to like three day before. It was, that was a mess. And then the middle is all written in leet speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think when I made uh, Epic Battle Fantasy 3, I didn't even know what object classes were. <laughs> I just stuck everything on the timeline with like yeah. a hashtag include. Yeah, that's the thing. You didn't have to like know classes or anything like that. You just code right on the timeline and make it do what yeah. you wanted when you wanted. I mean, even when I knew classes and stuff like that in AS2, I still did the timeline trick a lot because it was just super handy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I made like one Flash game that actually used like object oriented stuff everywhere. Like, even though I knew how to use it, I just. You know, I was making games in a weekend and just wanted to code stuff. Right. Man, good time. Yeah. The biggest reason I wanted to get the three of you guys on here, um, we, kind, we kind of spread actually almost two generations of the Flash boom. Um, so like Steve mm -hmm. and I, we, 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 we've been around since fucking 2000 or so on Newgrounds. Um, and then you guys came in. And Tyler, you in particular, um, kind of made us look kind of shitty because you just did so much better stuff than us. <laughs> but, but no Sorry. But kind of what i want to talk about like um so when we first started flash uh steve and i a lot, a lot of people weren't really using it as aggressively for games so we were kind of the first generation um you know we saw what tom was doing but we were probably already i don't know about you steve but i was already making games of flash before i found newgrounds were you um i i think it was right when i found newgrounds i started with flash yeah i was doing just html games before i found newgrounds and flash yeah, so I was doing stupid, like, button games, you know, like, you click on a guy and he dies, that type of shit. Nothing fancy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, for me, when I saw that Tom made the original Samurai Asshole, and keep in mind, this was Flash 3, so you didn't have, like, keyboard states or anything like that. Like, it could detect when you hit the key, and that was, and when you were holding it down. And he made, like, basically a fighter game, and that kind of blew my mind, and that kind of drew me to join Newgrounds. I didn't actually join it until I made... Uh, I'm not going to mention the game because it was very racist and it's kind of been buried and I'm not proud of it anymore, <laughs> but... <laughs> hey, everyone on New Guns has one of those that they've deleted since. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was literally just another one of those, you click a button and shoot things, but it, but it had more layers. But anyway, that was that was when I joined New Grounds. Um, I think my first big game was probably the Taipan 3000, and that was like still, it was really variable heavy. But anyways, we started doing stuff and kind of pushing what Flash could do. And then guys like uh, Tyler come along and they just start taking what we did and like take it to the next level. Like, um, but what's really neat, and, and Matt in particular too, uh, I saw a lot of animators. Like Matt, you started out doing, your first movie was fucking Sprite movie, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was before I knew how to draw. I just yeah. ripped, and you, ripped you, sprites you, from Final Fantasy. Right, and then you started drawing your own little Final Fantasy card, and that just evolved into Epic Battle Fantasy. Like, if you look at your, your Newgrounds pages, it's just a, a perfect transition into what you're doing now. Like, you've been so consistent. Yeah, and my then, old animations look exactly the same as my current games, pretty much. 
Yeah, they're, they're a little more, lot more polished now, but I mean, it's it's really cool how you took what you you know you started as an animator and Flash was so easy. You just started making games, like that's amazing. I realized uh, quite early on that animation is very time consuming, but if you learn a bit <laughs> of programming, you can make your animations last a lot longer. Instead right. of making a five minute animation, you can do a bit of programming and make those animations into like a two hour game, and it, yeah. it's just so much more cost effective. And I, I realized I, I, I'm ne- I'm never gonna go back to doing just animations now. It, it's just <laughs> it's just not worth it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. See, and then Tyler, when you came on the scene, you did a bunch of typical games like everybody else did, your general space shooters yeah. and things like that. And then you did, like, like um, I think the first game I really caught that caught my attention was that one you did with Dan Paladin. Uh, what the hell was that one called? The, the uh, Super Soldier. One. Soldier. Super Soldier. Yeah, you did that. Yeah. And you did a crazy car. And you were mm-hmm. one of the earlier guys that started using the freaking shape detections and stuff like that. And you can do that in Flash? And <laughs> yeah. That, that was blew crazy. my mind. Yeah, that stuff blew my mind. I remember it. That blew Dan Paladin's mind because I sent him, like, because I had this, like, platformer engine in Flash that where you could just draw the level and you could platform on it. And yeah. I sent that to Dan and he was like, well, you can just draw the level and platform on it. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that the way that, like, Alien Hominid and stuff worked was that you placed a whole bunch of, like, collision boxes for, like, roofs and stuff. Yeah. But like I this, so I, I had a couple of platformer games that used this method. I don't remember if it was something that I invented myself or saw somebody else do it. Like, because I didn't know what I was doing when I was making Flash games as a teenager. I just, you know, just made things that felt like like I was like, oh, this you could do, you could use this to do that, and then I would just make a game out of it. Right. Like I would like I would just take that little piece of tech. And then spend the two days putting a title screen and a scoreboard on it, and then put it on new grounds. <laughs> that's really actually, yeah, that's a perfect description of what you did. Like you would, you would find some new tech, but it would open doors for everybody else that was making games because we're like, oh, mm-hmm. you can do that. Like even like Steve, he did um, Rooftop Skater back in the day, and you know it might not hold up as well today, but back then it it had like physics. You know, <laughs> it was up down, and yeah. I mean, he he really improved it when he did the BMX game, but. The, just the idea of the momentum and the movement of, and stuff like nobody was doing that in flash games or not doing it very well and he had like this mm-hmm. fluid game um and the but, game also had a, a level editor too i think that i don't know how yeah. many games had level editors at the time but i think that was one of the factors that really made it take off because like it's amazing i've been to like just random places and people are like man you made rooftop skater like we had everyone in my you know, in my computer class, just sitting there playing it when we weren't supposed to or whatever. And c- because they could share levels, they could make their own levels and share them with each other. So, you know, and I didn't even think it was that pioneering. I was just basically looking at games, you know, other games that had, you know, like on console and stuff that m- maybe had some of those features and just was like, oh, I'll just, you know, put it in my game. I kind of want it for myself anyway. I'll just make a level editor yeah. for other people to use too. And it wasn't even like you uploaded your levels or whatever. I think you just... um you know, you just copy the little array of text areas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did a couple games that had that thing in them eventually. The original safe. It's kind of like the NES. The original save feature was you had to write down numbers and shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, here, copy this like 50,000 character code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing I kind of yeah. want to reminisce, though, like talking about these games, um, like for me, looking at gaming today, like the Flash game scene, it actually invented a lot of genres. Um, like what you did in Rooftop mm-hmm. Skater, Steve, you, you could almost say that was a precursor for what a lot of the um, uh, the Infinite Runner games do now. You know, um, Matt, your first epic battle fantasy, that was pretty much the template for games like Soda Dungeon. You know, endless fighting, uh, mm-hmm. kind of. It, the first <laughs> ones didn't have endless fighting. They were just uh, about an hour's worth of fights, and then it just ended. It was just like Final Fantasy, but without exploration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually like that, though, because yeah. basically was... you, you would fight waves, and then there'd be a boss, and then you'd have an a area where you could buy stuff and level up. Like, that was a really but basic... I, I, I wasn't... I wasn't innovating. I just didn't know how to program the rest. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, well, that's you, most You accidentally games. innovated. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. a lot of games that follow that exact like formula these days. Most of the like roguelike games out there do that. No exploration or minimal. 
exploration yeah. with battle followed by battle followed by battle. There's a formula that works. <laughs> right. I mean, and back to the Infinite Runner example, I mean, platforming games have been around forever, but, you know, the Infinite Runner has kind of been a recent thing, and that's just the distilled running and jumping from platforming games. So sometimes <laughs> taking an existing game and just boiling it down to, like, one fun part and expanding on that, like, that does create a genre. I agree. Uh, like the tower yeah. defenses. The tower defenses came from like Warcraft Two, and people would take the RTS and just make a little gauntlet for all the things to run through. And now that's like a huge genre, right? Yeah, I definitely see a direct connection to, you know, what came out of the whole Flash game era, and what's now on on mobile. I think there's a lot of, you know, just simple mm-hmm. mechanics, kind of quick gameplay sessions. I mean, obviously, thing layers have been added onto that, like you know, a lot of replayability and um yeah i guess like event event kind of content you know it's kind of things that have been added on that but yeah i i think that's why it was it, it was a the, the transition for me into mobile gaming today kind of made sense for me because it's like a lot of what i do is still 2d i mean even if there's some 3d animations and part of it a lot of the interaction is still pretty much 2d just because it's a tap screen you know and so right yeah yeah i mean i i don't think mobile games would be what they are today if it hadn't been for you know, the Flash game era and Newgrounds specifically. I really, I think it could have been something different. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, I think, yeah. you know. They would have, what, Solitaire to model off of. And... <laughs> right. Solitaire yeah. Minesweeper, that's all we'd have right now. <laughs> Every mobile game out there that has, like, those, um, that loop where you're doing something repetitive and buy power-ups that make doing that repetitive thing easier in between, like, rounds or whatever, that was all, There was. I remember when that, like, happened in like the flash game community like yep. i think i think the genre was called defense games yep. where you where they all followed the same formula where there would be a wave of enemies and then you would buy power-ups that would make it easier to defend against the enemies and there would be a stronger wave and that I was like, like that, in, uh, that in just flash showed games. up in like the mid 2000s in flash games and that's pretty much what all mobile games are now. So. Back then, those games were actually designed to end after an hour or two, which I like. <laughs> now, now they just kind of send you notifications to your phone, so you play every single day for the rest of your life, which is kind <laughs> yeah. of sad. Because mm-hmm. I want to finish the game genre. and move on to another game. Yeah. Uh, now their goal is to be just hard enough that you think there's a chance to win if you just... You just need that ninety-nine cent, like extra, <laughs> extra gems yeah. to buy that one power up that you need to get past the next wave or whatever. And then, well, now that you've spent ninety-nine cents, like, I mean, why not just spend five more dollars? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm the formula works yeah. so good, though. Like, it's funny. Like you were talking about when that formula got big in the early two thousands. I, I actually thought it was the dumbest thing because it's just so <laughs> tedious. So I actually made a, yeah. a parody of it. And I called it generic defense game. And literally you would swap in any scene and any character you wanted or whatever, just to show how easy and generic these games were to make. And it turned out to be like one of my most popular games of all time. <laughs> yeah. You could it, have it was one of my like most profitable. 6,000 mobile games. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's literally the game I made the most money off of. I'm not even going to lie. Like, it's Jesus. <laughs> and it was just meant to make fun of this genre that I thought was stupid. But boy, was I wrong. Yeah. <laughs> happen sometimes yeah and you have like a cow clicker right wasn't that as far as i know i think it was designed to be kind of a parody in a similar way and then i think it was a ripoff just was it was it which one was (laughs) Uh, me me and edwin mcmillan we invented that genre oh yeah what was it what was it we made uh av avgm ah where you just click where you click the light switch ten thousand times stuff would appear in the room that was 2011 or so that was before cow clicker that was before Cookie clicker. All right, all right. We, we, we had invented the that genre. <laughs> we invented y'all, that genre, and nobody ever brings that game up. <laughs> y'all owe these guys some royalties. That's what, that's what that's we're right. saying. Yeah, I want them cookies. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. So you guys all came from that flash background. Um, how did that help you get into where you're doing today? Like, so I know for a lot of us. We started getting sponsorships. Um, some of us did paid gigs. How did that look for you guys? Um, so I think I got I started getting sponsorships on Newgrounds when I was 15 years old. Like I, the first game that I had that earned money was Magnetism, which was a game that I released when I was at the end of being 14 years old. 
And that game earned like a thousand dollars in ad revenue when people played it on my website. In like, the did you have to get your, did you have to get your parents to like sign a waiver and shit for all that? I think my, I, yeah, I think my parents like the Google checks were made out in my parents' name, but they put them in my bank account. Um, but like that was like crazy because when you're 14 years old, a thousand dollars is a lot of money. Right. <laughs> right. Like that is like there's it's so much money when you're 14 years old. Like I was like all you people trying to get you know teenage jobs at KFC or whatever. I don't need to do that now. <laughs> I could just I could just make games for new guns or whatever. And then Fuck like you paper run. Month- <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then like a month later, like I think um, uh, Armor Games want- offered to sponsor. Uh, like a sequel to it or whatever. So then I made a sequel to it and they paid me more than what I'd earned on the first one from it. Um, which again was probably, it was probably somewhere between one and $2,000, which is a lot of money for a 15 year old at the time. Um, it's still like, it start you start learning like how to like what you're worth and how to negotiate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all the business aspect of it, because like you kind of like, you know that people are earning money off of you when you make a game and they put their logo in and like you gotta it's there's it's all these skills that like people just don't have if they don't go through this like if you just start in the industry and have not tried to like negotiate somebody paying you money for something and you don't know how to do that you're gonna get screwed so yeah it was good practice to have that all happen when i was a dumb teenager who didn't need uh you know, money to pay rent and buy food and stuff. Like to just, you know, you could make your mistakes and learn what works and what doesn't there. And then you're better off when you're trying to actually like have do it for real as an adult when you've had that practice. That's a really so basically, good point, yeah. yeah. So kids, make sure you make games young. Uh, let people take advantage of them. And, yeah, and don't don't sign any contracts. <laughs> just just someone's gonna be like, "Yo, I'll pay you this to put your logo in." Sure, sounds good. That they, they never sign. They don't. There was no contracts for like the sponsorship oh. stuff. Yeah, none. There was there was no like. I mean, they were buying games from teenagers, like the people right. on Armor Games and whatnot. Like they were messaging fourteen and fifteen year old kids for offering <laughs> them money to put their logo in the game. It sounds terrible when you say it like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, it, it kind of does. They would also do the ones where, like, the the worst was, like, the competitions. Where, like, right. you would enter a game in their competition, and if you won, you could get, like, $3,000. And if you got second place, you could get, like, $1,000. And yep. if you got, like, third place, you could get, like, $100. <laughs> and then if you got fifth through, like, 6,000th place, you would just get nothing. <laughs> but they would still have your game with their logo on it. Right. <laughs> I don't, like, those sucked. I entered a couple of them. I won. I only ever got first place in any of them, but I did get, uh, like, second and third place a couple of times. Well, at least you and were smart enough to think, put your logo in them, because my first yeah, game... They always but, felt bad. Oh, <clears throat> I did that first mini putt, and... I started seeing it on like TV and shit, and it was like all over the internet except for anywhere that that I had any say in, and I did not have my name in it anywhere on the original version. Yeah. I was like, okay, <laughs> lesson learned. God. Yeah. I I had a lot of people come to my website from the first game that I made that actually quote went viral, which was before it went viral when it ter- became a term. But um, somebody had rehosted the file from my website on their website. And their website was not in English. Um, and so I had swapped the file out on my server for one that literally just redirected them to my website. Nice. <laughs> and so they would click the game on this non-English. It was a very popular site. I don't remember what it was, but they would click the game. It would take them to my website. They didn't speak English, presumably, because their, their website was not in English. And <laughs> they would think that my website was a game and they would click the ads <laughs> and you would, that's how you made money on ads is when people clicked the ads. So that's for the original very, for, <laughs> pay to play a clicker game. <laughs> so for like a very brief period of time after I did that, my like CPM on my website was like ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. That's so much. Um, and then it immediately dropped down to like. <laughs> but it was my, enough to make like a thousand dollars. Nice. 
Matt, you had like a similar start when you got into games too, didn't you? Kind of yeah, yeah. The uh, for a long time, for a long time, I didn't know you could even make any money off Flash contents, so I, I wasn't trying to monetize it until uh, I think when I was around eighteen, Newgrounds started sharing uh, their ad platform thing. So I started making a bit of money then, but it wasn't a huge amount. It was only when uh, Armor Games contacted me to sponsor uh, Epic Battle Fantasy 2, and they offered me $6,000. I was like, what? You right? can make money? <laughs> I, I, I was like yeah. really surprised, and that's when I realized, like, oh, I might not need to get a normal job now. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I only did one game for Armor Games because... Uh, the next one, EBF3, was much bigger than the previous two games, and Armor Games didn't want to give me, like, proportionally more money. They were like, okay, maybe we can give you twice as much money. And I'm like, but I spent five times longer on this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Congregate, cause they say they'll, like, give me a performance-based deal. So they'll give me, like, money for the number of, uh, users I sent to their website instead. So I, I took a chance with them instead, and it worked out pretty well. Wow, you started out as an aggressive negotiator. Some of us learn quicker, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think one of the first times I made money uh, on a Flash game uh, was actually with Steve. He had got an offer from Sports Illustrated Kids um, for Rooftop Skater. They wanted it um, updated a little bit, so I did some art for him. That was like the first time I ever... And it wasn't like a lot of money, but like, it was like, whoa, I can get paid for this just like you guys. Well, I didn't even realize that was the first time you, one of the first times you made money. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I made Rooftop Skater because I was playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and I just wanted to make my own. That was about it. I mean, yeah, like these other guys are saying, I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to make a bunch of money. I didn't even know you could make money. And it was, I think, around 2001, and so it was kind of early enough that there wasn't a ton of content on, on Newgrounds, or at least, you know, <clears throat> Tom had seen uh, Rooftop Skater and decided to put uh, promote it on the front page as a featured game. And I think there was at least I think the game was featured for like a year or at least six months or something because there wasn't it was up there a long yeah, time. Like, yeah. I think nowadays, you know, there's so much content. Well, I mean, I guess I don't even know nowadays, but you know, for a long time, there's been so much content on Newgrounds that, you know, you can't have something featured for that long, you know, eventually wow. something else comes along and replaces it. But I was definitely very lucky, very fortunate to, you know, get in at a time where it could just stay featured for a while. And because of that, yeah, Sports Illustrated for co uh, Kids, they contacted me and said, you know, we'd like to pay for the game. And the same exact thing like you guys are saying, I was like, wow, I can make money off of something I already made for fun. You know, like, heck yeah, sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I'm a programmer, and so I didn't think my art was that great. And Sports Illustrated for Kids asked me if I could update the art. And so, yeah, that's how I think I first got to know Josh, Psycho Goldfish. Um, yeah, we... We we made we made that game. We made another one, the Sick Tricks BMX, and then, you know, I yeah, I got into the sponsorships. I got into like Mochibot ads, putting those in there. Um, I actually went I I actually went into business software for about five years, um, out of college because I guess I was thinking you know I this was fun to do in college and I made a little bit of money, but you know I didn't really know if it could be something that could sustain a living for myself. So, you know, I, I did the, the corporate route for a little while, but, you know, after like, it's, it, you know, it's just not as fun. You know, I, I'm, I'm not one of these guys that's like, oh, I hate the corporate world. It sucks, but it kind of does suck, you know, but at the same time, I learned a lot from that, those years working at that. And, but, you know, after a few mm -hmm. years, I was kind of like, man, I used to play games. Like I would even have dreams of like this person I used to be like, man, I used to make games and like talk to people on new grounds and it was all <laughs> fun. And now I'm just sitting in a cubicle. Like, what am I doing? So I think it was around, you know, 2008, I kind of got back into f making flash games and I, I, I did a thing called uh, the power of three in 2009 with Jay Zbarth. Uh, he goes by Zbarth and, you know, the two of us had made games in the past, but because of that, you know, this is something that I think new grounds has been so awesome about is, they put, the, you know, Tom, he puts together these collaboration events that put people together. And because, you know, I was kind of looking for someone to work with and saying, you know, maybe I could get back into making games. But because of this event, the 2009 uh, Power of Three thing, you know, it was, it was uh, me and Jay, we partnered up with a musician and we made a game called Paradox Embrace. And because of that game we worked on, 
Jay and I ended up working together for a number of years. We started a company called Clickshake Games. And that just that is when I got back into games and I started doing games full time. And I've been full time game developer ever since. Um, I guess it's been a decade now, I think. So, yeah, because we started Clickshake Games. It was like January 1st, 2010, we started Clickshake Games. Um, so I think for me, you know, Newgrounds has been there from the beginning and even in the middle. And, you know, just the opportunities that have come out of that have been so incredible. So to meet people, to, I, you know, I've been to the congregate offices and just meet some of those people. Um, you know, I got to go to the Newground party and meet some of the people that, I've admired, you know, that I've played their games and, you know, I get so much inspiration from just being at these events and, and all, everything that's come out of it has been so, so beneficial. Um, you know, so for me, eventually, you know, we did get some contracts through Comedy Central. You know, I got some contracts through a company called Fresh Games and eventually it did lead to mobile game development. And now I actually work for a company called Kung Fu Factory out of Los Angeles making mobile games. So I've definitely transitioned out of Flash Games, you know, in the last decade and Clickshake Games, you know, Jay and I have kind of parted ways on that, which is a sad, sad to say, but I'm definitely still very happy for, you know, all the opportunities that have come out of it. And I still love my job, even though, you know, it's, it's different from what it used to be. But, you know, I think um, I, I'm a pretty practical person. And so I, for me, I just I like just working on stuff. So if you can pay me to you know, work on challenging code problems and there's, you know, as part of a game development and I can get paid to do it, then, then that's awesome, you know, so. Yeah. That's actually one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this episode because, like, everybody knows what um, Matt and Tyler are doing right now. You know, they're pretty big in the indie game scene in their own right. Uh, but, you know, just from people listening who are, are getting into game design and stuff like that, you know, I wanted another perspective of, somebody who is working on games and is doing something they're passionate about. But, you know, like I said, you're not really well known as an indie game designer. You're, you know, you do it more commercially and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a great gig. And, you know, coming up through Newgrounds, that's always an avenue for people. Like, you don't have to, you don't have to be the next indie darling. There's always something you can do. So it's really cool hearing that. Yeah. And I got to say, you know, the, the years that I did click shake with uh, Z barf, it was, it was so fun. It was just, it was a lot, a lot of fun. You know, I, one of the things I realized about it is how much I love working with somebody else more than I like working on my own stuff because, you know, I, I made new, I made a rooftop skater and, you know, I got the opportunity to work with you, Josh, but you know, in the end, the things that you make that are maybe pretty popular and they're really cool and you're really proud of the feeling of kind of, the, I guess the feeling of accomplishment that you get from making that cool game is fleeting. And in the end, it's all about, okay, what's my next game? And as years go on trying to be an independent developer, trying to worry about the the money side of it, you know, like my, I got married, I got a house, you know, I was out of college. And so, you know, I need to support myself. I start thinking about like, you know, we don't really have great insurance. We're not saving for uh, <laughs> retirement, all that boring stuff yeah. that I literally didn't care at all about in college. You know, I'm starting to kind of think about it. And there's a certain stress that comes with, you know, trying to be indie because you're out there trying to promote yourself. You know, you're trying to promote your company still, you know, I'm, I'm doing my, I'm doing the web development on my site. I'm developing the games. You know, we're trying to manage contracts with certain companies, you know, to bring in some money the same time work on our, you know, indie dream game. And, and it, it can be stressful and that stress can kind of actually interfere with the creative process to where it's extremely stressful yeah. and, and I have, <laughs> like i don't know if people realize just how much money life costs yeah <laughs> like if you add it up if you spend three years making a game um and you're in like a reasonable part of the country and not in california where i am you could, <laughs> you could expect that you could that you'd probably need like a minimum like fifty thousand dollars a year if you're in a reasonable part of the country if you're in california you need like 100k a year or maybe 80k a year um <clears throat> but if you then if you have two people and you spend three years working on a project that means that for two people each earning 50k a year over three years you need 300k you need the project to earn three hundred thousand dollars which there's no guarantees whatever you make is going to earn that much and it probably won't <laughs> Right, right. It's very, I've had it's a very, very easy life. <clears throat> yeah, 
for me, like I'm living here in Scotland, so uh, our healthcare system is free. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, our higher hey, education is in. free. Yeah, rub it so in. So I, I, I didn't have to worry <laughs> oh, about yeah. higher education costs. I lived with my parents, so my living expenses <laughs> were like five thousand pounds a year. So yeah. I wasn't really worried about money at all. I was just having fun for many years, I guess. So I took the easy routes by uh, <laughs> living in a yeah. nice country, I guess. That's yeah. not really fair. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would be super stressed if I had to live in California because I, I know how expensive it is. And uh, yeah, that mm -hmm. would probably totally change how I think about my job and it probably would not be as fun. Yeah, I have years where like the years immediately after releasing a game where you're like, oh, I'm good. And then like a couple years later, you're like, oh, fuck, I got to actually make another game now. <laughs> like it just It just alternates between those two modes where you're like, you're like good for a couple years and then you have to like buckle down and make something again for a couple years <laughs> um but i mean i i despite all the stress i like it more than i would like a normal job yeah definitely. it also helps not having kids yeah. yeah it does kids are terrible i, I don't recommend yeah them oh i haven't like <laughs> that's pretty much the reason why why mugenics is taking a while is because ed has kids and the pandemic has thrown a fucking wrench in like our ability to like get stuff done reasonably because of that. Yep. But it's gonna it's ha it's happening. We're working on it. We're making progress. That's what I say about every new ground feature. Oh the pandemic, my kid. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The pandemic. You know, you know, we're all in this we're all in the same boat. Uh, Something like God. that. What was Yeah. <laughs> what was the thing that all the celebrities said or saying? They sang a song? Oh Everybody's god! Making fun of. I mean, we're like, all in the same boat, and they're like yeah. on a yacht, like talking about. That. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. I wish I had a boat. Yeah, that's that's, that's the hard thing about safest... being uh, being indie is getting that boat money. That's the hard. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't understand why people would want to buy a boat. <laughs> like yeah, you, have, you can buy anything you want, and you buy a boat. <laughs> You know, there's a thing called a boat person. It's a thing. It's like a breed of person. It's a, it's a totally different thing. So, yeah, I mean, if you're not a boat person, you won't get it. But, uh, you know, I know some boat people and, you know, it, it's great. Actually, when you you know you got your golf cart and you're passing other golf cart people and, and what you say is, this is what you say. This is a conversation. Hey, you, you going out on the boat today? <laughs> oh, I, I just got on the boat. I'm getting my boat ready. You going fishing? Hey, did you catch any fish? Yeah, I got fish. Hey, I got, I got some beer. And that's it. And if you can say those, yeah. talk about those three things, you might be a boat person. But you know, it's not for everyone. Like you don't, you don't need a boat to do that. No, I could talk about beer. All you could just lie. About it. You could just be like, "Hey, you're going out in the boat." That's true. And then just lie about it. Like you don't need to buy the boat. You don't need to actually go out in the boat. That's a good point. <laughs> you could have an entire group of people where they all think that everybody is a boat person. <laughs> But none of them have a boat. <laughs> it could work, man. All right, new game idea: boat person RPG. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the goal is to get a boat. <laughs> uh, I want to swing things back a little bit um, for you guys. How how um, was collaborating on New Grounds a big part of your life? I know you already talked a lot about that, Steve. But um, I want to hear from Matt because I know you did a lot of stuff solo, so. But Tyler's probably got like an hour's worth of collapse to talk about. So let's yeah. talk. Let's have Matt talk about it real quick here. Oh, when I uh, when I got my first sponsorship from Armor Games, I decided uh, I, I can't use copyrighted stuff anymore. So I gotta <laughs> stop using Pokemon in my games, and I gotta take out all the music and actually get some original music done. And uh, I, I can't remember how it started. At some point, I must have mentioned that in a blog post because uh, Frina contacted me at some point. Uh, and she let me use her music for free in uh, EBF2. And uh, I, I didn't even ask her to create anything new for me. She had a decent portfolio on Newgrounds already, so I just went through that. And I figured, hey, a lot of these songs would actually work for the game I'm doing. So that's pretty much how we started working together. And uh, yeah, that was fun. That was... It, it, it's nice that like the first person that I started working with kind of... We, we worked well together, and we're still working together today. I didn't have to, like, jump between lots of different people or anything. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've worked with a bunch of yeah. people off and on, but I can't say I've really had any real regular collaborators. Like Mind Chambers may be the closest, but like Tyler, you you collaborated with a lot of a lot of big names. Yeah, so like um I'm not an artist. I I mean I'm not like an animator or like I, I don't draw. I consider myself an artist, you know. I'm an artist, anyway, but I'm not an artist. But like I I <laughs> yeah, I can't draw for shit. Um so I as soon as I was like as soon as I had enough of a name on your guns that people like knew who I was. I was just asking people to like if they wanted to make games, like want to make a game together, or do art for this thing that I have, and send them a prototype, and then we'd like make art. Like I was just doing that <clears throat> for pretty much everything. I would almost always work with somebody different in like the early days of it. Um, there was like a bit of like celebrity like worship involved in my strategy and like choosing artists where I would message like the biggest names on Newgrounds and just be like, Hey, want to make a game? And um, some of <laughs> them said plan. no, but some of them said yes. So it like just worked. Um, like, I think that's how like, I, I think I just asked Dan publicly on the forums. Hey, you want to make a game uh, in like one of the threads where something I had made was on the top of the month or whatever. Smart. Do it in public, or if he says, "Yeah, no, I did it in it's public," like an and people were people were <laughs> mad at me. People were mad at me for that. Like people were like, "Oh, why are, you, did you, why are you bragging that you could that you could that you know these?" I'm like, I don't know him yet very much. Like I know him as much as you do. I'm like 14 or 15. I don't know. Wait, Super Soldier was 2006. So I would have been 16. <clears throat> but like, I'm just asking him on the forums. And uh, he was busy with Castle Crashers at the time, and he was like, look, you can make a game. Here's a whole bunch of art I had for some game that didn't work out. Just do something with it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's that's what Super Soldier was. Nice. <laughs> and then I did something with it, and then he liked it enough that he actually, like, went and did some a little bit more work on it. I think that took, like, three weeks, maybe two weeks. Right. But, like, I was stuff working with, with, with a lot of people. You did a lot of um, stuff with Bomb Tunes early on. I remember your uh Yeah, he was like probably my most regular collaborator on New Guns. We did Aqua Slug, we did that rhythm game Incubus Pulsum. I think there was one other game that we made. Let me just check my New Guns. I've made like <laughs> it's been so games. long. So there's like there's like a lot. Uh I'm pretty sure that we did three games. I'm just trying to remember what the other one was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it looks like it was actually only two, but I think it just felt like was, three. <laughs> I think we might have made another game that just didn't um didn't get released. Probably ah, right. Yeah. And what was your first game with Edmund Ether? Was that the first one? Yeah, Ether. Ether. Um, yeah. I just want to say, right. I just want to say that game is incredible. When I played it, it just made me feel something special. And I just want to give you kudos. You. I want to take some time out to just say that game was really incredible. There's a point when you're just floating oh, through you. space and you're like, I have no idea if I'm just drifting off into the nothingness. And then you find mm -hmm. a planet and that feeling is just so amazing. So kudos to you and, uh, yeah. and Edmund for that one. <laughs> so, thank you. We've wanted to make a sequel to that for a while. It's just, it's going to take a while before we're in the right place to do that. <laughs> that game ends with a to be continued and we've never like <laughs> continued it. <laughs> I think but a yeah, lot of us old school um, Flash guys did the to be continued and then never continued it. I think that's a trend. Yeah, that's a trope in Flash <laughs> games for sure. <laughs> um, but no, that was like right after I um, left for college before college started. We made that game in two weeks. Um, the way that that worked was that Ed was uh, common, commonly collaborated with Florian Himsel um, to his comics on Newgrounds. What did he mean? They made Triacnid, and then I think he also programmed Blockhead, the game. Um, so he was a common collaborator with that guy. Um, and that guy was unavailable to work on anything at the time. And I was the only programmer who was on instant AIM, Instant Messenger, um, at the exact moment that he wanted to make uh, the space game. Oh, just a second here. Me. Um, just for you Zoomers listening, it, AOL Instant Messenger was a little bit like Discord, just so you know what it was. Okay, continue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that was every. I like. I had everybody on Instant Messenger, AIM. Um, 
But yeah, so he had messaged me on there. I I had him on my list because, like I said, I was messaging pretty much everybody that I could in like to like 2005 to 2006 era. And Ed was one of the people who I asked if he wanted to make a game, and he was one of the people who said no. <laughs> <laughs> but I had him on my messenger list, like as a result of that, and so then he knew my name. Because of that action script 3.0 meme, that was a thing on Newgrounds around the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if people remember that. Uh, I remember the <laughs> that kid who um, <laughs> at Comic Con or PAX one year he like grabbed the camera in front of the Newgrounds booth <laughs> and s- just shouted like uh, "Glail Gamer, if you're listening, Afro Ninja has issued a flash off action script 3.0. What now?" <laughs> that was like that was a meme for a while. Oh, fuck, so I forgot how, all about that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that's how Ed knew my name and recognized me as a programmer when I was on um, Instant Messenger, and so that's why he messaged me. And then I he told me the general idea of you're like on an octopus and you swing up into the clouds from a planet. And then I sent him like a day later a prototype of that. Um, with all the crazy gravity stuff where it's like rotating the camera and they're all over the place. And then we just made the game in two weeks. God, I hate you, uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nice. I'm not like that anymore. <laughs> I swear I've changed. Takes takes me years now. It's it's fine. I'm cool now. I know. It takes me years. <laughs> I've, yeah, made I've never fun. made a no, game in that In 2017, fast. I made a clicker game in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Dude, fuck. back in those back in the Newground days, I would literally stay up like twenty four hours straight until I started having like a a light migraine with like lightning bolts <laughs> flashing across my field of vision, and that's when I knew it was time to be done working on games. Yeah, and then then you sleep. Well, for when the game was done, and... that's when you knew. Yeah, <laughs> we're like, all right, I just have to put the, the the play button on the title screen, and then I can submit it to Newgrounds and go to sleep. <laughs> Did you guys have that shit where you go to sleep but your brain was still debugging everything in the game and you'd wake up like two hours later and fix something? Oh, yeah. Oh, I still have those dreams. Oh, I hate I've those. Had, I've had dreams where um, code that I wrote months ago, I'm like sleeping and I'm like, oh, God, what if this happens? That that would cause a crash. Over there. <laughs> I'll, wake up, I'll be like, what the fuck? I've not touched that code in two months. And then I go to my computer and I check. I'm like, oh, fuck, this is broken. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly the way that my dream said it was broken. That's you know? great. They're like three uh, in the morning, and then I just have to go back to bed. <laughs> you know, I have those. I have those, but then I also have this other thing where I think my brain's figuring out a code problem, but it's totally not. Like maybe I ate too late or something like that. Like I ate pizza <laughs> yeah. just before bed, and like my brain's trying to figure out like how to debug the discomfort <laughs> in my stomach, and then I wake up and like you know I don't sleep well. <laughs> that happens as well. <laughs> I yeah. only have that one. <laughs> He's got to bypass the digestion function or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, it's just, it's the pointers in the wrong spot. <laughs> I think I have dreams where I have good ideas, but then I wake up and realize they don't make sense. Yeah. But those those, those, those are the ones to go with. Those are the best. I've sometimes had ones where I, where I wake up and I just groggily like open my laptop and just type the idea down and close it and then go back to bed. <laughs> I wake up and I'm like, oh, what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> it happens yeah. with tweets sometimes. <laughs> I was gonna say I've seen you tweet like that before. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh shit. Oh well we're getting close to the end mm. of the show here, but um do you guys have any like advice for maybe the new generation? We obviously Flash is not the route to go, but um, uh, me personally, I would love to see uh, another freaking web game renaissance. Like, how do you guys feel about that? Yeah, I yeah. don't know if it's gonna happen. I mean, though. I, it's it's very unlikely that it's gonna happen because mobile games are like, like I don't know that many like kids who even use computers regularly compared right. to iPads yeah. and phones. But look at That's it this way. That okay? kind of makes me sad a little bit, but like also. Yeah, but look at it this yeah, way. If you if you that. actually made HTML5 games and targeted them for mobile, you could run them yeah. on Newgrounds or whatever, and they don't take up any storage space. So when you got those cheap-ass fucking on-five budget cell phone that your parents got you because they don't want to yeah. fucking pony up for the 
iPhone and shit. You know, those are perfect for those kids. I think I think there's a market mm-hmm. there, and I think it's something that needs to be tapped into. Yeah, for sure. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, like, I'm, so, there was, I'm, I'm sorry. There was another question that was completely different right before then about advice for new people. Yeah. Let's go and back to that one. Want, how do you want, like, or just like ask a question and then answer something completely different? You know, it's just, so, right. it's so much harder now. It's hard to give advice because I think if, yeah. we, if we sit here and say, do what we did, I don't know that we can say that that's going to work anymore because lots of people I are mean, doing what we did. To. Yeah, yeah, like you have thousands of people doing what we did, and we just happen to be lucky That's... enough to get in early. So I would say, yes, do what we did, which is, you know, I I just put in a lot of time. Like I think anything has yeah. to involve lots of time. And and I'd have to say, like, making games is very hard. And so um, there's plenty of times when I will spend, not, not so much now, but when I was first starting, there were so many hours and hours just kind of staring at something like, what does this even mean? And just just working through that and, and having that perseverance, I think that's kind of like a universal piece of advice that I would right. hope, you yeah. know, anybody serious about it's <laughs> kind of already figured out that part that like don't give up easily because I think even more than ever, you have to work really hard to to kind of get your game to cross that finish line. But I think the other thing I would say is I think it's important to be somewhat practical. And, you know, I, I think it's great to be independent and I have so much respect for guys that can, and girls that can, uh, you know, make a living and and remain, keep their independence. But I think almost everyone I've talked to that's been independent has admitted that at least at some point, you know, they did a little con- contract gig or like, you know, yeah. maybe somebody asked them for, for like a little paying job that wasn't their indie dream that they did anyway to kind of mm-hmm. pay the bills. And, you know, a lot of the companies we admire, like I think even um, the behemoth, I think there's a lot of practical business that happens that we don't really hear as much about that you kind of have to respect that part of it. And, you know, I think a lot of a lot of indie people talk about, you know, the dream and the art, you know, because that's kind of the promotion side of it. But for people that are serious about making the stuff, I think it's got to be a balance. I would say, you know, definitely fight for the things that you believe in, the things you care about. Try to make, you know, your artistic vision, but always kind of have that other practical side of thinking about, you know, what is what do people want these days? You know, it, and it's hard because I, mm-hmm. I don't want to sit there and say, you know, chase the trends, because by the time you chase the trend, there's already another trend by the time you finish. So I think it has to be that perfect balance of like, you know, kind of having a vision for maybe what other people aren't doing, but then also yes. also not completely ignoring, you know, what is it that what is it that the market is asking for? You know, what are people doing and playing? And yeah, I mean, if you make a, a web game, as cool as that would be to, to think that that's going to be like a new renaissance and it could happen, who knows? But, you know, you kind of have to realize that, yeah, I mean, people are on their phones, you know, and how can you how can you uh, cater to that? That's the question. My advice for people is like, um, it, it's very simple, like, because, I mean, obviously I can't tell people, you know, make games and post them on, like, Flash games and post them on Newgrounds, and because that doesn't work anymore. But, um, well, you can still post games on Newgrounds, but, like, that's, like, like you have to, um, my main advice to things that are still, like, universal is that, one, you gotta, you gotta, like, make friends in the industry, and I don't mean, I mean people, like, at the same level that you are at, um, roughly, like, um say like same age group same general experience have a big group of people that are all like in it together going through the same stuff as a community and um then you know as people as you get older and people find their way into like uh more real jobs and careers and stuff you'll have all these people as connections that you all like went through the same thing together when you were younger which is pretty much what happened with a lot of us on Newgrounds because there were a lot of us who were just teenagers posting stuff on Newgrounds. And as people manage to turn that into a career, having all those connections available to you is very useful. Um, And the other thing that I would say is that you got to start really small, make very small games that you can actually finish and make a lot of them. That's still relevant advice because you have to be, you have to, um, know how to actually finish your projects. This yes. is something that nobody is good at. 
Um, it's something you have to practice just as much as any other skill. Um, and if you don't do this, your first project is going to take five years and it's going to suck. And then you're going to be like, fuck, I wasted five years. That's pretty good advice. What do you got for us, Matt? Uh, I was going to say, things were so much easier in Flash because uh, you didn't have to worry about marketing. You just published your game on one site and all the others just got it from there. You didn't have to <laughs> yes. program for different platforms because it worked on every operating system and everyone had Flash installed on their browser. You didn't have to worry about like quality assurance because your game would only have a lifespan of a few weeks. And if there was problems with it, you could just make a sequel using the same engine a few months later <laughs> and, and no one would care. Everyone would be okay with that. You didn't have to deal with customer service. You could just be rude to people in the comments if you wanted to. No one yeah. cared. And it was like so many things you didn't have to worry about back then that now you do. Even publishing something on Steam takes several days because you have to make so many like screenshots and icons and you have to do trading cards and achievements and everything. Like everything is so much more work now and so much more complicated. So it's, it's hard to say what young people should do because that's all, all sounds kind of overwhelming. But, uh, what I think still could work is just making free games for the publicity and to kind of make a reputation for yourself. You can still yeah. publish free stuff on Steam for, well, it costs a little bit, $100, I think it was last time to publish a game there. But if you make a decent free game on Steam, a lot of people will download it. Like, you could get hundreds of thousands of people playing it. And uh, same with mobile. If you publish something there for free, you can uh, use that to build an audience, and then later on you can make a bigger version of it that people might pay for so it's, it's harder now because uh back in the flash days you could make a lot of money with, from free games just from the advertising revenue and uh today that that's just not good enough you won't make much from ads you have to find a better way to monetize your game so i would say you probably have to be willing to make video games like for free for a few years probably just as a hobby until you find something that works for you and you find an audience that likes what you're making and then you can start worrying about how you're going to make money after that. Yeah, that kind of goes with what yeah. Tyler was saying too. You, like you stick with the small stuff that you can actually finish. Uh, that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. Like even today, um, yes, Flash is dying, but it's it's actually still fairly easy to become a very big fish in a small pond if you're in a community like Newgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. You can you can take that as a stepping stone and move on. Uh, a lot of the cool things I see happen on Twitter where people just are constantly you know, showing animated gifs or short videos of what they're working on. And it's like what you said, Tyler, where they, they kind of have that group of friends and they all kind of retweet each other. And it's just this organic thing. And mm -hmm. once, once you start getting following those guys and they follow you and it's, it's, it's very motivating on top of everything else. Uh, you focus on those mm -hmm. small games, you build a library, you build a name for yourself. Um, one thing that I would add, and Steve kind of hit at this, is um, you know maybe not necessarily focus on what people want because um, I think what a lot of you guys did, uh, you did things that people had never seen before, even if it was just a little concept, you know, just a little mechanic here and there. So I think if people, yeah. you know, take this time when they're young and and use these HTML, and there's so many free HTML5 tools, it's never going to be as easy as Flash, but mm -hmm. there it, there's there's not a ton of barriers to get into it if you really want to. But I would say, you know, do what you guys did and experiment. Or in Matt's case, Matt did, you know, like he started out with one style and he stuck to it and he stuck to it and he stuck to it and people liked it and the audience grew and grew and he's been so consistent. So you can, you can do a, like so many things. You can either be, you know, really consistent and build a fan base on what you do. Uh, Madness is another great example of that consistency. Um, mm -hmm. Or I'd like to say that I don't think I ever did anything particularly original. I just copied games that I liked. And, and you did it just consistently. Cut, cut, cut out the, <laughs> yeah, I did, cut out the parts that I didn't like, and I just did my own spin on a genre that already existed. And right. I made it playable mm -hmm. in the browser. So a lot of people probably had never seen that game before because they didn't own a console and they were just playing free games online. So I, I guess I just brought existing stuff to a new audience in a way. Yeah, and it worked. And yeah. like Tyler, Tyler did a ton of experimentation. Uh, you came up with mechanics that we hadn't seen before, um, mm -hmm. and you did a lot of small stuff. And a lot of the stuff you did, yeah. we see in other games now. Like um, looks like a Fractum, like that picks the cats, pretty yeah. much that idea, and it's amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, if yeah. everybody's doing these small 
things and sticking to them. And, and even like what Steve said, you know, you, you're just, you're learning and you're, you're developing these project management skills. So you don't, you don't have to become an indie game developer. You can get the job in the industry that way. So I think all of that's great yeah. advice, especially when you put it together in an advice sandwich. Yeah. Like just don't, don't worry about money. Yeah. When until you're you starting to. out, cause you're not <laughs> going to like, until you have to, well, I mean, well, I mean, that's why you should just have a day job and do the stuff in your free time and make sure that whatever you're working on is not make or break for your financials. Because if it is, yeah. there's going to be pressure and then you're going to be like, Oh, well it has to be good now. So I have to, um, you know, it's, um, I have to, uh, put more Don't time take and effort alone. into it. And now, Oh, well I've put more time and effort into it. So it's taking longer. So now it has to be better. Like you get stuck in this loop. If you're too stressed out about it, instead Put a fucking logo and title screen on it and release it. And if it sucks, it sucks. And if it's good, it's good. Move on to the next thing. Whatever you've learned, whatever you want to do differently, save it for the next thing. Just get shit out there until you're confident enough, until one of those ideas that you try out feels like it has more potential than what you did initially. Like that's that's how you know when you want to spend time on a project is when it feels like there's more you can do rather than it feels like that you have to do more. Yeah. And if you fail, it motivates you to do better. You don't get discouraged. Like that's you're, you're in it though. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right. We got some, a uh, couple audience questions. If you guys have any more questions in the live audience, please go ahead and ask. We, we can do a couple minutes here. Um, mm -hmm. Not a ton yet, but uh, who just asked us? I just lost it. Uh, Kokos was asking if any of you guys have tried your hand on HTML5 game development. I've done a little bit with Phaser. I have a, I do have an indie game that I worked on and had to shelf, but um, Phaser is kind of interesting. Uh, it, it's come a long way. Like at first, I was a little skeptical about performance and stuff, but I've been pretty surprised at how how good you can get stuff. At the same time, the more I wanted to add, you know, tweens and particle effects and stuff, the more I started seeing it chugging. You know, because the the dream of HTML5 is um, you know, not just on your computer and a browser, which might run fine, but also on mobile devices that are varied. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that I think it's, it's awesome that you can hit every, every different device, but you know, a lot of these older devices that people still use that maybe you're trying to hit that market, like the game chugs on it. So I've kind of actually been thinking about switching my HTML5 game back to unity just because it's like, well, if it's, <laughs> if it's not going to perform amazingly in a browser, then why not just you know, use Unity, which is, you know, hits all the different platforms. And in a lot of ways, I'm more, you know, comfortable with that workflow anyway. So I guess for me, I'm still not completely sold on it, but I still think there's a lot of potential there. And it, it depends on how complex the game is. Honestly, the game I was making was not that complex. So I was surprised to see that even a few tweens on the screen was already starting to chug on like certain, certain devices yeah. that are like a couple years old. So... <laughs> I have yeah, no idea. I've, I've, I've only used Flash and Macromedia Director. Yeah, if so anyone when, remembers that one. When Flash started dying from the internet, I just moved on to focusing on um, quote unquote real games. <laughs> 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 I was like, I'm going to do this. There's no, Those aren't going anywhere. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, no, nah, because when Flash started dying, uh, the tools for HTML5 sucked. You couldn't do shit with them. There were no tools for them. What you could do is too limited. Like it might be better now, but I just am I'm past that. Yeah, I made a JavaScript only game, a clicker game, a couple years ago. Suck you box. Look it up. It's about loot boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I played that a couple with days HTML5, ago. <laughs> even though it doesn't have graphics. That's right. As long as it's got HTML. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Mr. Johnson 22 is asking Tyler was, uh, a chain reaction game. The first chain reaction game. Uh, no, I literally copied that idea from some other game. I played. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I don't remember what the other game I played was called. It was, it was a little jankier than the chain reaction game. I just saw it. And I'm like, Oh, that's kind of neat. Let me make a version of that. <laughs> <laughs> But it was close enough. It was the first good one. How about that? Sure. <laughs> uh, Ninja Muffin ninety nine is asking. Ninja Muffin ninety nine is asking. 
what was the best version of Flash? Because we need to settle this once and for all. I'm still using uh, Flash CC 2015. CS3, baby. That was my go-to. Yeah, CS3 was like a really good one. I use Animate 2019 right now, and it kind of sucks. And Animate 2020 is absolutely unusable. Um, I like you can't draw a straight line in Animate 2020. Like, <laughs> like, like this is yeah, a bug yeah. that has persisted. Like, I have a, a I have a 4K monitor, and in we, if Flash is maximized to the whole screen of the monitor, and you try to draw a straight line and hold any button while drawing a straight line, such as Shift, which is a button that you often hold while drawing a straight line, um, it just doesn't work. Like it, the whole thing kind of freezes until you let go of everything that you're pressing on the keyboard. And I was on phone support with Adobe after complaining about this on Twitter. They called me on my phone, an Indian guy who said that he's with Adobe and he wanted to take control of my computer. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. Uh. <laughs> but it actually was, it actually was Adobe support. <laughs> <laughs> and it took two hours to get this guy to actually bother trying it on his end and seeing, oh, yeah, the thing that you said happens does happen. I'll file a bug report. So maybe a W will fix it within the next five years. Until then, you can't fucking draw a straight line. This is one of the most basic things you expect yeah. an art program to do, and you can't do it in Animate 2020. <laughs> there's there's so many drawing bugs and so many features yeah. that work worse and worse in each version like one thing that i hate is that previewing animations is now so much slower than it used to be i can't even preview my animations at full speed anymore yeah. i have no idea why my computer's incredibly powerful and i can't do it and it, it was no problem in the past really random which animations play at full speed and which don't There's i've, like I've no, noticed that no correlation if you play if you play the timeline that's nearer the left side of your screen, it runs faster than frames that are on the right side of your screen. Oh, that's, that's so how weird, weird it is. <laughs> like, it starts off fast, but when the timeline gets to the right side, it just starts lagging really bad. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's so bad. Like, I, I don't know how these problems have been around for so many versions. I hope you're like, listening to this mm -hmm. shit, Adobe. I hope you're listening. I, hope I don't so. think they care because they must already know about stuff like this. Like, there's, <laughs> they there's probably drawing have two tools. people left working on on Flash and there, Adobe, on Animated Adobe. There's like, you just yeah. maintain it so that people keep paying their 50 bucks a month or whatever it costs to have it these days. Yeah, let me just there's say. There's drawing tools that don't work at all that have probably never worked, like convert lines to fills, which is supposed to turn your lines into a paint bucket <laughs> shape. It just deletes most of your lines. You know, you have to yeah. like convert it one square at a time. You have to yeah. like cut your image into tiny pieces and convert each one at a time or else yeah. it just doesn't work at all. And that would be a really useful tool, except yeah, it doesn't work. It's also not that difficult to code. And I know this because my engine, in order to render lines, it converts them to fills when it loads the flash file. And that was something that took me maybe a couple days to write using a library I found online, and it just works perfectly. And that's just really <laughs> sad. Yeah, this is the thing that like that really like made me realize how bad Flash had become was when I started working on the engine that I have, which loads a Flash file, converts it to triangles, and renders it with the graphics card, and then you can do whatever you want in C++ to manipulate the graphics around. Um, my then... When I was in 2010... I did. I took me two weeks to get a proof of concept of this working, and the thing ran a hundred times flat faster than Flash. <laughs> <laughs> and I had not wow. bothered optimizing it in any way whatsoever, and it was just a hundred times faster than Flash. This is painful. <laughs> and I was twenty at the time, and I'm like, "Wow, seriously, <laughs> what is Adobe doing?" Yeah, if we could just go back to the days when you could just own a license instead of having to pay a monthly subscription. Whatever that last version was, I'll go with that one. That's my vote. <laughs> CS6, which I still own a license to, but yeah. That was the last version you could actually load AS2 files. I was trying to load like an old an old Flash pro an old AS2 Flash project in Animate 2019 just to like look at some of the code and you yeah. can't because any code that you placed on an object was deleted. So Ugh. You can't even like you can't even attempt to try and like convert it to an AS3 like compatible thing. Like it's just gone. You have to download CS6 or earlier. <laughs> That's uh, why I have four versions of Flash installed. All right. <laughs>
Here's a deep question. It's, it's more about self-care, but how do you guys deal with stress and doubt when you're working on a long project? Uh, nobody knows. <laughs> Alcohol. That's what I go to. I try not to these days, but yeah. I, I You know, I, I like to think of myself as a professional that's somewhat seasoned, but there's times when I, t- you know, I, I costed a task at like, a day and I'm still working on it a week later and I'm supposed to every day give a stand up update on what I've been working on. And I just feel terrible. I'm like, guys, I just, <laughs> I let you down, man. I'm just, I'm a worthless human being. This is taking way longer than it should have. And then I eventually figure it out and then I don't die and I don't get fired. So I just kind of move on. So I, I think kind of the answer is, I don't know that I have ever really gotten over just uh self-consciousness. I I'm always super critical of, of, you know, my, my coding skills and I just keep trying to go at it. Yeah. Oh, you can get over self doubt by just taking a look at what most people are doing and most people kind of suck. So (laughs) yeah, most most programmers are terrible. And if you just take like one look at any like article online from like a programmer who doesn't know what they're talking about and you're like, wow, what a fucking idiot. Oh, maybe I'm not that bad. (laughs) Like I'm like, just, just do that. There's plenty of articles out there about people writing stupid op-ed bits about programming and they clearly don't know what they're talking about. I play a lot of indie games on Steam and a lot of them just don't launch at all or they they just don't work correctly on a (laughs) two-monitor setup or they have all sorts of problems. And then you kind of look back at your own games and you're like, well, maybe my game has less problems than a lot of these (laughs) games. It's not that bad. At least yeah. it works. <laughs> it works. I mean, it's a self-care thing. Like, you shouldn't go and then, like, tweet at these people and call them morons or anything. That's not what I'm saying. You keep it. You keep this shit internal. <laughs> well, <they> are, well, <laughs> like, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. You just want to, like, fix your own feelings. Yeah, that's right. One thing I like, like to you just do. want to be like, everybody else sucks but me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the mentality that you need. One thing Assuming I like to do is... Right, uh... so. Like if I get a good review or somebody gives me some good, you know, compliments like, man, you did a great job on this project. I like to save those in a file. And it's just kind of nice to, you know, when I have self-doubt to kind of go back and just be like, okay, you know, like give yourself a little confidence boost. Like I know what I'm doing, you know, Um, sometimes that can be helpful, I think. You just look in the mirror and you're like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. (laughs) Yeah, there's like a self-help line you can call where somebody compliments you for $5 a minute or whatever. I think the best motivation for me is that I know even if my project flops, it'll be over and I won't have to worry about it anymore either way. I just want it to end. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) fucking great oh shit well i really appreciate talking to you guys this has been a lot of fun um you guys got anything you want to plug before we sign off yeah i'm working on a hardware project which is weird uh you can look it up at jabbermask.com it's that that face mask that i made that went viral that like moves when you talk actually turning it into a product we need people to sign up on that um you'll be notified when the kickstarter goes live this is a weird. That's a very weird project for me, but it's it's a it's an interesting one. Now, can you wear it's, it to? It's pretty uh, cool. Can you does does it work for COVID? Like, does it is it effective? Is it an effective mask? It is done? a cloth mask. So, however good cloth masks are for COVID, <laughs> it's that good. Nice. You, you can, can put wear a-, a medical. You can wear a medical mask underneath it if you like are concerned. Yeah. <laughs> But like I, I'm pretty sure Kickstarter doesn't actually let you sell products that claim to stop COVID. So like we can't like be like this stops COVID. It's just as good as a, as a normal cloth mask would be. There you go. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll say that uh, you know at Kung Fu Factory, at Kung Fu Factory, we're working on uh, quite a few projects that we're putting out there. Uh, we did we did some work with Lego, and now we're working on a sports puzzle game. So that's kind of something that we haven't seen on mobile yet i mean if anybody's found something that's doing a sports puzzle again then let me know but uh, we haven't found anything like it so we're kind of excited about this project we've been working on for quite a few months and hopefully we'll be getting a game released somewhat soon i've actually worked on a number of canceled projects like in the last couple of years so i'm really looking forward to actually releasing something soon (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of our games that we are going to release and we have announced is uh, Atari 
uh, combat. So it's kind of a it's a it's a tank puzzle game. Oh, oh yeah yeah okay. And it's it's yeah it's kind of uh, you know spinning off of that kind of uh, IP there. But you know we made a we made a tank puzzle game. We're working with our Atari. Uh, we're really happy that that one kind of was shelved, but it's kind of coming back. Uh, it might actually get released this year, so look out for that one. That'd be cool. I loved combat, man. It's a little different. I mean, I would say it's very different, but uh, it is a tank puzzle game, so look for that one. Spiritual. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm slowly working on porting EBF5 to mobile because uh pretty much already works. It just needs to be optimized a bit so it runs a bit smoother. And besides that, I'm also going to have to republish all of my old Flash games on Steam at some point. I'll just have to go through them and remove all the copyright music and stuff like that. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Uh, besides that, I'm kind of just encouraging people to decompile my games and mess around with uh, mods and stuff. Because uh, my Discord channel has uh, a lot of people talking about that kind of stuff. They're uh, using Flash decompilers to add new stuff to EBF5, which I didn't think would ever happen, but They've made a bit of progress. They've already added in some weapons from previous games. They've uh, added new status effects and a lot of cool stuff. So if you know how to use Flash, you should go talk to them because they don't have any artists. So if you can make Swift art, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> nice. And don't forget nice. to buy EBF5 on Steam. You, you forgot to plug that Yeah, part. yeah, yeah, buy that game. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not been on a steep discount and probably won't be anytime soon, so, so don't now, bother. Now's waiting. the time Just to buy. buy it now. Sweet. I want to throw out one more plug. Um, I've been involved in the early development of a conference in the Midwest for game indie game developers called GDEX. I think it's like in its sixth or seventh year now. So this year, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the, it's it's got to be a virtual conference, just like you know a lot of other things. But um, it's it's a pretty active community in Central Ohio, as well as you know, kind of pulling in people from nearby states and even further. So I'd go ahead and plug that. It's the GDEX.com, I believe. Nice. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool if the Midwest got a bigger gaming scene, then everybody could get out of expensive California finally. Yeah, I don't want to go to any more conferences in San Francisco. I live fairly close to San Francisco <laughs> now, and um, that's when I stopped going to GDC because it's more of a pain to drive there than it is to fly there. Jesus. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, on that note, we're, I think we're going to call it a show. Again, thank you guys so much for coming on. It's been a blast revisiting the past. On our next episode, uh, your uh, boy Ninja Muffin ninety nine is going to talk to some uh, more modern Newgrounds artists working in the HTML five field. We'll we'll see how uh, how much shit they talk about our Flash people, but uh, tune in for that. That'll be uh, <laughs> coming up pretty soon. I uh, also want to thank Water Flame for letting us use the song Gabber Fly. Awesome tune. Check it out. And thank you all. Uh, the live audience was huge today. We really appreciate you coming in and all you listening to the recorded version. <laughs> you guys missed so much cool stuff in the pre-show, but hey. Yeah, we're talking about Bitcoin and stuff. It was amazing. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> Quantum computers. What else did we not talk about? Uh, the weather. <laughs> oh yeah, the weather. Uh, you missed it all. Racist old yeah. games. And finally, don't forget to support Newgrounds. Uh, I'm your host, Psycho Goldfish, signing off. Thank you for listening to the New Grounds Podcast. This show is recorded live on our Discord server. Join us at bit.ly slash ngpdiscord. Long live New Grounds. <laughs>